there is something which has to be um, experienced and you cannot say um, that drawings, models um, are architecture and they are just presentations. So um, what I'm dealing with in my work is um, the space and the ideas about the space which I present um, through models, fragments, and to represent or react in the space with installations. And I would like to say that for me it's very important to um, give the idea of um, net necessity, uh, being in the space and experience the space through the senses. Um, well, this is a model for a third specific installation. I've been done, um, I've, uh, I've been, I've done in my city where I'm coming from. I'm coming from Ljubljana. And, um, it's only the idea. And this is another idea. All these models, I call them um, axiomatic structures because they are dealing with axioms of the space, existing space, in between building structure and infrastructure. Um, in a way, they want to solve or they wish to solve a um, space problem in the grey spots in the city. Um, but at the end they are just models. And there is another model for a floating roof, light object. with a big mirror in the middle, well, at the entrance of uh, a big city. Um, and then I would like to say that I'm interested in um, non-material materials, maybe, uh, dealing with light and sound and uh, smell in the space, which I think also creates environment uh, of the space and affects senses and feelings of perceiver in the space. This is light object. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this is Breda, this is the exhibit, well, at the exhibition Filia mentioned before, uh, I was invited by Filia um, and I entered this room um, as the first one, the first one from the, from the group and I had this possibility to work in this space alone for three days and it was a great experience. Um, <laughs> everything is, everything goes wrong, <laughs> which is okay. <laughs> well, this is a curtain, yeah, you see, I don't have to explain. It changed the condition of the space, that was my reaction. Yeah, um, that is all, thank you. <laughs> I'm Anna Best, and I'm also working at the Rikes Academy at the moment. <coughs> um, can you show the slides? Thank you. 
Um, my, I'm a, I call myself a sculptor, um, but I sort of see sculpture as a, not as a finite object, rather as a, um, an active process of making a relationship between myself as a body and as a, um, have the many years of experience of life and um, the place where I find myself. Um, this is a piece which I've just made. I was invited to a, a workshop, an international sort of symposium in Senegal in West Africa. And it's a tent modeled on a, <coughs> the same form as a European house tent for camping. Um, well, there it is. Can you show the next slide? I bought the fabric when I was there, and it was made in the, one of the many tailors in the city. And it was, it's like um, making a territory for oneself anywhere you go or something like that, and also a social space. Um, can you show the next slide? This is just a detail. Before that, I was in England, um, working in the countryside at uh, another very similar workshop, a meeting of international artists called Shave Workshop in Somerset. And um, one of the works I did was in a tent and invite, did a, an at-home and just invited all the participants to a kind of a hardcore techno party in a tent. So it was a bit of a joke, really. But I was trying to make a connection between this piece and the piece in Senegal. Um, can you show the next slide? Um, this, this is about, um, I think, being in the street, being scared of communicating with people and somehow having more communication with the dogs in the street and kind of following them around and the fact that that's okay to do but it's not okay to follow a person. Can you show the next slide? And the next, please. Um, I'm showing you work from about two years, by the way. This is a... Uh, I was invited to do a, a kind of sculpture commission in a forest in Yorkshire and this was the response, it was a collaboration with Alexandra Fontura. And we did a sort of five day performance of just walking around and doing things that would invite people to ask us what the hell we were doing. So we could then have a conversation about whatever. And sort of playing with the thing of looking like we were very functional and utilitarian and doing something important in this environment where actually we weren't, and that's just, I think there are two images from that. Can you show the next? <coughs> um, okay, and the next, please. And this is a piece in my flat in London last, last year, another collaboration, and it's, um, it's called Burning Toast. Can you show the next slide? You entered the room, and the, the, it was just a false floor built at neck height. And it was a sort of to do with inviting the public into one's front room and really altering a domestic space. And the next slide. So I think that's it. Yeah.
Okay, um, we're supposed to now open this to some kind of discussion. Um, so I'm going to invite kind of observations from the floor. It's obviously quite difficult uh, when we've seen a lot of very disparate forms of work. Um, but like the people who've shown this afternoon haven't really had an opportunity uh, to be kind of asked about the work. So maybe we could kind of start off and include people this morning if people have questions and observations addressed to particular contributions. saying like you know if no one speaks in a minute I'll pick on someone and I'll have to speak for an hour That's absolutely right. I mean, perhaps it would be useful to just go back over some of the discussions that we had in kind of setting this up. We certainly didn't want to have a tight agenda. Uh, but there was a kind of historical and contemporary issue, which really was, could be put in something like the following way, kind of what did you want to do in the 60s? Uh, but couldn't, in a way, perhaps for certain technical, uh, technological reasons. And now that you can, does it change what you want to do? So I think that was the, the kind of historical dimension of, of the issue. And secondly, really, in adopting the, the term action, perhaps one way of looking at that is, is to refuse precisely some of the terms which are currently used, um, which would kind of stress the discursive the, as if there's a sort of vast amount of theoretical discourse to get through before you ever do anything, um, and to insist on the, the quality of action, the quality of an intervention the quality of a performative uh, which is involved in constructing objects of a certain kind. So those were some of the considerations that we had in, in setting this up. Um, because there was a necessity to try and find out how to make certain um, phenomena work using mechanical means. Um, there was no being painting about them, it could help me. And there was no um, uh, previous um, information I could go to. There was an invention activity that took place. Now, that was a very hard situation. And suddenly, um, some of the pieces that came out of that um, were probably less sophisticated at some stages, but uh, at later stages you could see other pieces of electronic um, hardware and software would come to bear and 
But, I mean, having said that, something about the corporeal nature, the material, the experience of that was very real. And I know probably, I think, perhaps tomorrow John Fraser, in terms of uh, computer um, technology, will be looking at some aspects of how this comes to be an update mental concept in terms of where space can be moved around. And also the way that um, I think Peter Stryker, who unfortunately was not here this morning, because I'm now showing some color structure, uh, projected lighting this morning, Peter, that, that you certainly in terms of the computer at a later date have taken on board and manipulate in a far more sophisticated uh, universal way than I was able to do back in the 60s. So certainly there are ambitions to do things in terms of the larger space and particularly of color that Peter could now generate as a computer power, but I had no means at that time of ever, ever generating, except on a small scale, um, although I could work on areas such as this room with large moving programs with projected lights. And that was really slightly before the computer as such, but I was making very crude programs. Interestingly enough, Rebecca Horn has taken them as a device, exactly the same as the piece I made in 1965. So talking about technology and what we can do there, the Rebecca Horn is doing something at the moment that I did in 1965. That's quite interesting, because sometimes the advance is not necessarily uh, in terms of technology, an advance in what the artist wants to do in terms of their expression. And I think, in a way, some, something we're talking about today it's not just about technology, it's about the way artists or fine artists find expressive room to manoeuvre using new technology. So sometimes they might turn it on its head. And there was one or two of the artists who, who, from Holland this afternoon, which were like almost turning a new technology or technology at the time into some kind of pre-archetypal uh, imagery that, that comes out of like, buckets of oil. A strange phenomenon that almost revert you back to some uh, almost prehistoric period with a little fire of buckets. So artists, I think, can turn things on their head in strange ways, which might not advance technology uh, in the way you might have asked the question. Um, so I hope that answers that. I think it's a very interesting way in which the difference between the artists, I mean, we will get some trouble at lunchtime to sort of suggest that the artists and the architects were talking about the same language and uh, the the presentations would be distinguishable. But here I think is a very marked difference that, that when we review tomorrow morning the the way in which architects approached this in the early sixties, what they did was basically say they had these ideas but weren't ready to do them. And the other artists like Hansen uh, immediately got themselves involved and were prepared to do it in a very uh, kind of elementary kind of way. So I think what Barry said is extraordinarily interesting. Um, one of the, uh, out of all the kind of people from the 60s that they tried to bring in tomorrow, the only person who might make it is Gordon Pask, and those who don't know him, he's very aged and very ill, he's going to be wheelchaired in at lunchtime, and I hope he will speak immediately after lunch. Um, but he, in the Cybernetic Serendipity Expert, exhibition in the ICA in the like, 1968, roughly, uh, actually had one of the most complex um, interactive sculptural pieces that ever been created. Now he was able to transcend the technology by a combination of sheer bloody determination, brain power, and particular skill. But most people didn't have access to it. So my immediate reaction to Barry is, yes, I think for most people, the inhibitions that he's, and the difficulties that he's expressing were real. And what was interesting was that the, the, the two camps uh, responded to this differently. The artist responded by writing about it and doing absolutely sweet nothing, and the art artist uh, responded by doing things which were relatively uh, simple. You don't mind me saying that about the Robin Wright, because you say to start that you weren't in, in a position to control the electronics at that time. So I think in that sense, there is a very real conversation of that way. A, artists and artists responded differently. B, the technology has actually changed over that period to allow more access to people to actually do what they're talking about. But nevertheless, there were the occasional maverick, like Gordon Pass, who cut through the whole thing and actually delivered things, which are almost kind of sort of embarrassing now, because they did what everyone else is, is now talking about wanting to do right now, and Gordon did it 30 years ago. And uh, I think that might be a very interesting um, kind of com conversation tomorrow. And if, if manages to get in and manages to speak. It seems to me that one, one of the questions which emerges is that already we seem to be using kind of the term 
technology in two slightly different senses. One in a kind of technicist sense, like genuine, hard, kind of scientific advances uh, in kind of computerization, whatever, which lead to the possibility of doing things. But another is a kind of technological sense which is more easily expressed uh, in philosophical terms, where compared to the 60s but initiated <coughs> then, both across architecture uh, and art production, there is, as it were, a new and a different way of situating the problem, for example, of the human body in respect to space and of the complex kind of arrangements, some prosthetic, some whatever, uh, you know, which are clearly kind of marked in some of the students' work this afternoon. So, you know, it's, it's technology in the sense that, that, that there's a kind of um, sensitivity to probably what will turn out to be a rather fundamental change um, in the way in which people investigate the relation of the body to space. And one of the technologies that's used there and was clearly used in some of the presentations this afternoon was also uh, to some extent present in, in Bruce's earlier work this morning is the kind of technology of narrative, um, which, which wouldn't have been um, kind of obviously there uh, in the 60s. So it seems to me that, that, that there are two branches of the issue of technology which are obviously connected, uh, but may finally turn out to have been a fairly fundamental mutation in our practice and in architectural investigation. I think that goes back to Dibbs' conception. I mean, uh, Bruce is very, uh, very humorous to talk about the, the kind of conceptual difficulties of raising questions about, you know, where is the ground on which you're going to put your carrot, where is the flint, and all those sort of issues. It's sometimes quite difficult for people now to get back into those kind of conversations, but for people who were there at the time, they see those as being the starting point. And, and I also sort of describe all this in kind of problematic terms. I think what would be nice tomorrow if we can uh, particularly get people to, uh, maybe in the morning there should be some reflection first, uh, or new reflection after tonight, after the uh, very glass think about it, but to have a particular concentration on, on whether we've been liberated now by having availability uh, and access to techniques undreamt of at that time. Uh, but most of these things are not necessarily technological, they're not necessarily more computing power, but they're conceptual leaps in terms of thinking about ways of evolving things, for example, which is obviously one place in my own heart, but which give you access to, to procedures which were just simply undreamt of in the 60s. So we have this sort of clash between the enthusiasm, the excitement, the exhilaration of breaking in something new in the 60s, compared with the sort of pragmatism and, uh, and kind of operational skill which is going on now, which wanted to do it properly and really deliver. So the choice is <laughs> well. That, 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 that's another question about the generation. I mean, maybe they the very difficulties of doing it, and the very they had political difficulties. We heard the school would be by camera. We were told uh, that all these sort of pressures on them. They didn't have to be they had all this, and maybe that makes them fight in a particular kind of way. Maybe now or when. Well, can I just add, I think that also implicit in the question you've asked is the nature of authorship. How do you make the decision to go in that direction as opposed to that direction? And that is a, a question of value and authorship, that um, in some self-critical way, you choose a direction for certain reasons, that you hold certain values to be important in going in that direction. So, up to a point, I, I think it would be wrong um, to think that in the 60s, just to go back to that idea of what was the technology um, that was available, which did we choose? I mean, I mean man did go to the moon, for example. I mean, there was technology around that was allowing um, conceptual notions uh, which had been held before about space 
to, to be uh, undertaken physically, even though I mean, I'm probably the person in this room actually saw it on the television screen. Uh, I know Bruce saw it live. I saw it live. <laughs> I was so, there. So, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the history, I mean, like today, the business all the work that people have done, and that's quite daunting. It's totally frightening. Bruce and I were trying to some Martins when people came to go to talks. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, wealth of information. Well, I went to Martins, I went in one day, and I thought when I got out of the ninth floor, I walked into this room, and somebody immediately put a leather jacket on me, started to polish his leather jacket on my back. I thought I walked went onto the moon. We had it. <laughs> I had those kind of throbbing pink substances on the floor and all those other things. I had gauze hanging up, lights and extraordinary. I thought, I thought, this is a bit daunting. I've <laughs> come to make some, come to make some steel sculpture. All those things which I got, because it was very much immediacy that night. I went to an exhibition in Rome called Contemporary, which was at the end of Art of It was very much a a situation where you went in and engaged with the artist doing something. It's like a performance. I hadn't gone into the museum stage yet, but it was distance. And also, the video is maybe only in its infancy. So the, the way you get a moving image is actually several stages of the movie. You couldn't really use an image through video, but if you could, it's very low-tech. Uh, you know, held by all the top he gave since tremendous liberation, there to look point of camera, be able to say there was a camera point and you see the image on a monitor. I think that was quite a big step because everything else had to be relatively live. You did uh, if you did a work, you did it for an audience and it might somebody might have been taking photographs or somebody might might have been taking film. But the results of that came out of the stage. So there was, I think there was more of a sense of something happening. Relatively low tech actually, I think uh, technology was something which didn't particularly come into the land, but my perception was concerned. It was a, it's a technology which was the guy in the shed technology. It's a technology which um, didn't interfere with the artwork, or might have informed the artwork, but it wasn't controlling it. And one of the you know, fears that you might be talking about, I don't know this is a generational thing, is that technology for me now presents a big problem because I'm not literate in that technology. <coughs> As I think your generation probably knows about school or whatever, how you use computers, how you use kind of technologies we didn't have access to. It's all like the system, the whole system has to go through, like the like learning, learning how to use something like the administration in order to, you know, connect it to the other towns or something like that, to see them, and then it's like, Thank you. 
dance for them things. I'm sorry, I, I don't agree with that film. Well, I think that's not. I think the performance needs to get uh, the whole thing about uh, about moving around was to try to make kind of a moving sculpture. That, that's what it was about, and it, and it was only called performance art. I have to say that again by somebody at the Arts Council who couldn't deal with people who behave badly. Who gave the grant? Well, eventually, to the third and fourth generation, people would call themselves performance artists, which I've never called myself, and I never would be, and never will. I've never been in a performance person. Thank you. But I, 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 well, I, 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 I think you disagree with. Well, something you said, I forgot what it was. Come back to me, then. Of course, of time. Can I just take an aspect of this that you're saying again, <coughs> which John is talking about? It's that this repeating action is also tied up with a kind of consumerism. And one of the things we've not talked about today is the kind of political temperature in the 60s and the way people may work. Both political. <coughs> Uh, uh, Marxist socialist, anti bourgeois kind of way, but also the notion of consumerism. I think what Bruce was just hinting at and what John was talking about is that sometimes this repeat at a later stage doesn't always have to be this, but can be a kind of repetition to making the product to a consumer audience. Certainly with myself, and I, I know with Bruce in the 60s. One did not repeat work because repeating work, just for the sake of repeating it, was, if you like, the boss of necessity was derived through to what the reality of it was when you were doing it. If you were driven towards it for whatever the reasons were. Repeating tended to become a kind of consumer orientated notion, um, which that some artists and some aspects of the way I saw in the 60s um, had political um, inclination. So I think something else in what should be said. Well, I think that's the point. I think the problem is a lot of things were underground, and we can't get kinetic art, as it was called. Was, you couldn't mention kinetic art for years. Mm -hmm. The big show that was in People like Peter Fuller, and I will say this, the big show the ICA, when people picked on certain aspects, that I think were kind of this, what may have related to consumers and um, uh, novelty things, uh, tricksy little objects. But I think the extension is real space. It's the exploration of real space and how you as the artist could explore that in a kind of laboratory way. So reality testing seems to me to be what it's very much about. Yeah. And none of those people ever picked up on that at all. They just wanted to downgrade certain areas Certainly, yeah. by picking on the weak Achilles hills. Also, the other thing, and this is not meant to be um, anti uh, uh, foreigners or nationals in the country, but it's also something in this country which was, unless you came from South America, or uh, some other part of the world, you were also not entertaining some of the galleries or some yeah. of the critics who wrote about it. Um, very anti-English people. Yeah, and certain kind of rules and regulations for being a Canadian artist were, were, were imposed and stuff, and then it was destroyed and pushed under the ground. And then, and then that also got, but that also, the, 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 the moving thing and the breaking down of the object also got into this other idea of movement and actually using no objects, and then it became conceptual of body art, process art. And that, 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 that rose with the uh, revolution, the student revolution, and it was actually stuck as well. And, and it's very hard to find any documentation about most of these shows and so forth recently. Which is quite interesting. And uh, I think that what's, why we start talking about this in a sense is that there's a kind of, uh, it's a feeling I find all over the place that people in, uh, are, are tempted to deal with floors and chairs and spaces and, and behavioral things that, uh, and environmental things in a, in a funny sort of way. That it's, and I think it's very encouraging, actually. But it seems that it, we have to speed it up a bit because a lot of stuff's been done. We want to heave on very quickly, otherwise we're all going to end up in the shit, quite frankly. And um, that's what interests me. There is a, that's why I think this necessary. I don't even put it better. There seems to be a kind of obsession with behavior and space and movement and no object, but it's to try to maintain, uh, for us as artists I mean, and architects, it's good. I think that there's been a lot of uh, interaction between art, architects and artists and <coughs> from the conceptual days. Uh, John, did you agree on that? Well, well, well yeah, yeah, sorry, I was just trying to wedge <laughs> <I'm just trying laughs> in. Do you remember that you were having a back? I was trying to drive a wedge into kind of provoke some sort of conversation. I, 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 to just pursue that one, I, I think one of the ways to come back to the question about authorship 
is that, in order to operate, I mean, uh, Bruce has skewed herself open up this morning by the one hand saying you want to do group stuff and not all verb and yeah. stuff and, 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 and not record it. On the other hand, it was uh, always uh, you know, one was a picture book, one was a tax man, one was a bank. That's that that a real problem for all of us. Somehow everyone has to operate. And, and that requires sponsorship, it yeah. requires grants, it requires exhibition space, it requires commission or something. And I think that's one of the kind of things that differentiates the artists and the artists is that their means of getting public uh, renown, getting their sponsorship, getting their 10% uh, tax number is, is divided by the, by the way in which they define themselves. So I think there is a sort of trap there which we all slide into inadvertently. That we, 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 that this notion that we can give generous for example, we're all very excited about putting stuff on the internet freely and openly to everybody. But then who authors? And who gets to know? And now at the university, they count the number of papers you've done, and they count this, and people you Well, I think that's what I forget about. Forget about authors and all this stuff. They're counting everything you do, every word I write, every sentence I, this has all been documented, and that's it. You used to increase and decrease my salary, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Like, that's a fact. That is fact. <laughs> but no, I think we should worry about things like that. There's too much worrying about uh, all this kind of, uh, it's mine, it's not mine. I mean, it's everybody's really in the end, you know, and, um, you know, just that we all did it before anybody else. <laughs> but no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's everybody, but um, it, it has to be that way. You know, we have to break down this kind of <coughs> situation to continue. I'm surprised it still continues to uh, gallery. I thought a galley was a, a galley was a walk between one room and another or the wind to the Well the lot had stopped. Yeah. Bruce. Yes? What do you if you say that, what do you think um, the situation would be now from from your viewpoint in Sydney? Uh, do you have any idea or vision of what life as an artist? I imagine I imagined um rain clouds going from one place to another, fertilizing land. I imagine people moving from one country to another and from hot to cold as they move to them. I imagine uh, vegetables uh, in season. I imagine uh, all sorts of things. I didn't imagine that, uh, a, a huge choice that we'd have to do, which is actually no choice at all. I never imagined that. I never imagined that things would get worse than they were. I never imagined it would be less. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I can't buy a chip cigarettes and a cigarette machine. That's why I don't smoke, basically. I never imagined that would occur. <laughs> I never I thought that we'd, things would get would would get better and more interesting. Less, 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 less objects produce uh, more tranquility, more um, So what's produce what's less control I mean hmm? worse controlling. We are the consumers more or less. We are part of it. Yeah. So where, where, where do you think it is now? The control. The control that means you don't get your cigarettes from your machine. The one that made it. I mean, it must be. We've we allowed this to happen. I, this is, I don't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't imagine that. I imagine the fact that I can buy a single cigarette or a pack of lunch at close 10, 5, or 20, or 25. No, I can't do that. I'm being rather stupid, but I, I didn't think that, I, I didn't envisage that we would still be stumbling around in white walls, grey floors, and polished wood, and be kind of a um, circumspect. Yeah, but isn't that the interesting aspect about how, how technology was sort of used uh, in, in this attempt to challenge authority so, so that you sort of ended up with this virtual reality that you were kind of um, working in, which sort of supported the, 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 the continuation of the gallery. Well, there, there is a period when new technology does away with certain human beings, like taking telescopes and things, you know, trying to get back to in space. Yeah. Well, the human factor is very important. But what's happened from the very early, I mean, all the work in the 60s was a big positive thing. I mean, you say you're politically motivated, all the political is your ideas and philosophy, basically. Yeah. And so in some way, because all you want to do as artists was promote some sort of better way, some utopia, I and mean, the architects were doing the same thing, in a sense, it's all failed. If we take today things other than yesterday, 
So today we do sort of have the cynical view of our generation to have, because we want to be cautious, and we know it doesn't really work out like you planned it. Yeah. I mean, do you think, do you take any responsibility for that? Yeah, yeah, we didn't say no often enough, basically. Yeah. I mean, one thing that hasn't been kind of discussed is the way that certain forms of technology have kind of unintended consequences. I mean, no one kind of wants them or doesn't want them. Seems to me like there's an incredible kind of <coughs> impact on the study of, say, art history. You know, once people started putting up two slides at the same time to make a comparison. Uh, the, same, the same thing happens that, you know, architects come and speak here several times a week. And what they do is get up here and show their work on a slide. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm not quite sure how you would chart or write the history of that or the consequences for students. But it inevitably <coughs> has the consequence that, that, that buildings are now, in some sense, there to become the object of a certain kind of image. Uh, and you can actually then, you can, you can literally chart the way in which then, when people go back to an object, um, they can only kind of reuse it in an imaginary space dictated by the image. You can actually see it if you walk into certain kind of squares in Italy. People will get off the kind of bus, buy the postcard of the building they're about to see, and then situate themselves where the point of view of the postcard is. I mean, the, the most persuasive example I know is that when you talk to people now about the nature of a Gothic cathedral and where you see it from, they often refer to the view from high up on the west, uh, the west window. Um, as, and, and, and that's where all postcards of Gothic cathedrals now kind of display the cathedral. I think there's a very precise origin to this. It was, it was when the coronation was first televised, in whatever it was, 1953. They kind of built something up, so that's where it's done. And suddenly that kind of becomes, through the kind of technology and, and people's positioning in respect to it, a very determining feature in one's relation to an object. So, you know, a, a lot of, I mean, by, uh, by a certain kind of definition and necessity, what we've seen today is there on a slide, or increasingly there on a video. And I think one of the questions is, well, wh you know, what are the consequences then for one's relation to the object? Indeed, it raises the question of what, at this point, then is the object? Is the object the thing that is represented in the video, or is it the, the kind of video of it? Uh, and when people say, well, you know, what, what's, what's a gallery space become? To some extent, it's just become a small studio. Uh, for kind of making kind of videos of objects. So, you know, there are questions about, about the consequences of technology, which no one has either adopted as an artistic manifesto, nor kind of opposed on political grounds, but nonetheless, behind everyone's back, kind of creeps up on them, creating possibly quite radical changes without anyone being not uh, noticing it. thinking towards the future. I mean, I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, and, uh, you know, another point, just to add to when this happened, apropos the camera of Goldsmiths, it was bought, because you weren't here for the whole morning, I mentioned this. The camera was bought to record the students' work who wanted to apply for postgraduate courses. Before then, the, uh, the student had to send the actual work, which was looked at. From that point on, they were sending slides of the work to be looked at. So again, there's this uh, metaphor for the work through the slide. This is, this is I don't know, it's about the architecture. So in the 60s, when there were the beginnings of the notions of um, non-representational forms, of the idea of responsive things, the idea of uh, things that could evolve and change in time, were influenced by people's interaction with them. In the end, the requirements of publishing made these ossified into images which were presented in traditional architectural terms. So the dynamics of change, as exemplified in architectural drawing in the 60s, went right back to the sort of 20s and 30s, because no one invented a new architectural vocabulary. 
So little kind of curious icon about dying or living, so the crying started to appear as sort of gestures that something was supposed to be changing. But that the notion that we've got inside a medium that really can change has not been understood by the music's representation communication through the normal magazine and other channels of information. So unless you actually get inside a medium, this is impossible. And, and the only example that most people can come up with is a computer virus which is entirely appropriate for the medium within which it is traveling. It is subversive, it is out of control, it's mischievous, it does all the things that art said it was trying to do in the 60s. Uh, and yet, curiously, um, the artists who are using their computer find themselves struck with this thing, far from applauding it as a representation of exactly what they were trying to do, they're extremely angry with it, and, and regard it as irresponsible. And so we have a kind of, <coughs> as we evolved, it's a kind of cultural uh, responsibility overlaid over the top. So we've got many layers to get the We've got the common imagery, we've got common representation, we've got common communication, and so on. And, and uh, therefore, extremely difficult in actually acting within the media. There's a great narrowing down, in fact, what you're saying. There's only been a fascination for art being made in, in real time, in real space. So, I mean, for the number of people on a very basic level, down around somebody painting a picture on the foreshore, uh, it's just something to come and actually paint it. You wouldn't want to look at it. It was on the wall or the gallery. It's the same thing if artists are making work. It's more than the only for the audience it's saw at the time. The only means of seeing it after the falls through documentation. That is comparatively new. Actually, the relevance to the space they were doing it is much more personal than the curating show would simply travel to one meeting galleries or something and never had the hand. Never in a sense had the artist there except the inauguration or something. That seems to be a big difference to what I started well, with. The best coming up shows the medium, true, isn't there? I mean, that, that why do we see Bruce's work more akin to the sculpture about Hopkins' own, own choice of that than to say opera? Uh, or other forms of theatre. It, it doesn't, uh, I mean, apart from his own shots, it, it, we all feel it's more, it is in a, it is in more in a, in a conceptual changing field, which is what this is a provenance of art, maybe. I mean, I'm not saying I'm very clear, sorry. I'll, I'll back off and leave that as a question to Bruce. Um, <laughs> you don't see yourself as an opera form. You don't, you don't see yourself as a performer at all. You just said that a few minutes ago. Um, so what do you know? I see myself as a performer of sculpture, but not as as involved in performance art or making performances as such. Not performance art. But but everyone else happily goes along with that. You are seen quite clearly as a sculptor and artist, not as an opera singer. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I just want, sorry. I I the question very badly. I I just, I just maybe obviously you must have reflected on that. This form is about the way that you see yourself as being classified as a performer and, and how, how you feel it is that people do feel that unless you are clearly <laughs> Lines to the library to get the latest um, art forum or a magazine with the latest American work in it um, to look at it and uh, rush off to their studios to make something not dissimilar. Um, so the speed at which uh, visual communication was was put at that time by the magazine was certainly something that many people were hot putting it towards, um, and even not just students. I mean, that's not the way. Mature artists are also looking very heavy. And I, I also see that uh, new technology, in terms of the speed in which uh, information can be sent as uh, via the computer now, also presents a rather similar problem. And I think you hit the starting talk about it earlier when you said you quite truly put information into a, a networking system, or, or do you? Which then has, uh, has access to it by anybody in the world who chooses to uh, tune into it with the computer. So this, 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 the speed at which communication of image and idea has taken off has been steadily growing faster and faster in the 60s, given the means that we've uh, put into building 
technology uh, hardware. Um, I think personally it's a, a narrowing of that situation up to a point. Perhaps at the zenith of it somewhere, there's really means of making advances. Um, you mentioned um, super cybernetic uh, solubility show. Um, as perhaps an example at that point, there are things probably going on right now too. But it, it's curious though, we've got this, this ability to actually transmit information like, like that <laughs> instantly. And yet there's like, well, I think there's one art magazine in Britain now. Is there one now? Two. Two. Whereas in the 60s and 50s there was like many. That's contracting. So in fact there's a kind of illusion that there's all this information and, uh, and all this stuff. I think it's an illusion. I don't think there's any more. Not that you left. No, no. no. It does work. I think there's a difference in the method of translation. Yeah. Yeah, but it's very real in the minds of people who deal in business with money when they transfer what is supposed to be fortunes around the world of investment, which is an exception what computers do. So maybe artists are to some extent sort of in a different relationship with the new technology because it's already employed in very different ways to how it was in the 60s in the world of politics, finance, whatever. Maybe you cannot approach it in quite the same way. You have a statement coming on? It's, it's coming on, it's not quite there yet. Well, hang on. Well, it's, this, uh, it's, 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 it's the last person to think in real time. <laughs> Does anyone else have any kind of contributions? Or observations? I mean, I, I can actually see quite a clear link between all the things that we're, that we're presenting today. Quite clear. I didn't see any kind of... There's lots of different people showing things. It seems to be quite clear. Um, closely connected, actually. I think it's and... Uh, yeah. I think it's very difficult for us to appropriate technology for our own end when, as you say, it's already in such powerful use. And uh, ours just seems like a laboratory model of it. And I think there's a very great frustration about dealing with a model. Yeah. No one really wants to be dealing with a model anymore. <coughs> Okay, we're actually going to have to set up for another lecture that starts. Sandy Wilson is supposed to start lecturing. Who wants to stay and hear how the British Library is getting on? <laughs> uh, we're going to start tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the Slade. At what? What's the actual room? In the gallery. In the gallery. So those are at the AA, that's where to go. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>